Greetings. My name is Guy Dornsey, and this is a new season of Change the World, the show where I like to invite guests on who share my sense of a world in the future that's positive, that's visionary, that's exciting. We're not moaning and groaning. My guest today is Isol de Bell from North Couchen, lives in a beautiful place right down by Maple Bay. And I've invited you here because you're doing some really interesting work with the forests down in North Couchen. Tell me first about, you, you told me some amazing stories. You fifth, fifth generation. Well, that's including my children. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Tell me about living down in Maple Bay. Well, <laughs> I moved back about eight years ago. I moved back. I was in the city. I was yeah. born there. And uh, it's just been the most sacred place in the world for me forever. So. Sacred because? Well, it's... Definitely the forests there are yeah. extraordinary. They're, they're not old growth. They were logged 60 years ago, yeah. but they have been growing back. And in my lifetime, I've watched them grow back. Yeah. And so I have a relationship with them. And it's just this, uh, I've lived in the city for yes. various reasons and yeah. had wanted more than anything to return to the island. Yeah. And this bay where my family had yeah. places. So then we found out, several of us found out that the Forests were being logged, about and so, areas so, were. So, so you, scenario one: you're living peacefully in the forest, you're loving the trees, they're slowly growing, and then you get this realization: there's logging tape, right? There, it's a bit complicated. There's six mountains around uh, Ma Maple Bay, yes. the va va Couchin Valley, yes, and uh, so there has been logging going on in the backs of the mountains yeah. since. It's it's very complicated, but yes. since the 80s is when the Forestry Advisory Committee and this. Um, yeah. it became more regulated how they were going to so, log. So, so let me step back, because when you started inquiring about the forest, you made a big discovery, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, I'd advocated for uh, the same forest on Stony Hill where I live. Yes. Uh, four years before, a road, was, uh, logging, or a road was coming through the first time for a, a different type of road. The second time, I found logging tapes that were bringing in yes. a logging road. Yes. And this was a shock. It was, but uh, you discovered that North Couchin, the municipality, owned all this forest. I did know this with a few people yeah. because of our earlier activity with yeah. this, this road that came through four years ago. We did, s some of us knew this. What yes. I didn't know is that almost no one in North Couchin knew that these six yeah. forests were public owned. And this was shocking because this included people who'd lived there all their life, you know, yeah. 70 years. So unless people worked in right. the municipality around forests, yeah. No one seemed to know. So, so I gathered that there's a, there's a full 5,000 hectares of forest owned by the municipality of North Couchin, and they came into ownership because in the 30s or 40s there were companies logging it, and they just walked away and didn't pay the taxes. Pre previously, they, you know, going back to you know, the beginning of the 1900s, they yes. were logging. Right. It was all logged. <laughs> so, yeah. they, so they did walk away. Um, and the, was, the municipality acquired it through non-payment of taxes. Exactly. And so now it's owned by the residents of North Couch. That's right. That's right. So then you got excited and said you wanted to make a movie about all this. Well, we found out this, when we found this logging road, you know, that was slated yes. to be built, we found out that logging was coming in, um, in several areas yeah. on the valley side of the mountain as opposed right. to the back side. Yeah. So w as we learned that nobody realized this was happening, there are bike trails, there are yeah. parks, the, it's changed so much in the last 20 years. Yeah. The, the amount of people who are using yeah. these parks yeah. and, and, and there's trails everywhere. Right. So we got a treat for our viewers. We're going to show your movie. Okay. You, you're now a famous movie producer, right. director, whatever you call yourself. So let's, let's roll with the movie now, right? In this beautiful world, there are places so mystical, so magical, that everything ordinary is transcended and most people are reminded of everything that may be possible. Inspired by the potential of great improbabilities, there are visionaries who may, by way of an extraordinary legacy, set a purposeful, potential course for generations. It is the way many of the great parks and nature preserves have come into being. Not so long ago, in a land sheltered within encircling forested mountains, on an island, such a story begins. In the beginning, there were trees, ancient and massive, 
and the people of the valley saw the trees and said they were good. Then came people from across the sea who cut down the trees on the mountains, saw the profits they made, and said it was good. In 1946, long after much of the valley had first been logged, a quarter of the land was set aside as forest reserve, a rare and valuable legacy owned not by any private company, but by the people of North Cowichan, to be caretakers of six forests on six mountains, Zuhalem, Maple, Sicker, Prevost, Richards, Stony Hill. The land never to be sold, always to be managed by the people for the good of the people, now and forever. After its creation, with the passage of time, the amnesia of forgetfulness or ignorance set in, and the memory of the legacy of the community forest was forgotten. As the forests began to grow back, logging began again on the backsides of the mountains, and warning signs appeared posted on trees and metal gates. Private forestry lands, private logging roads, private, not public. How the signs appeared, no one could say, no one asked. But the people of the valley read the signs, saw trucks descending from out of the mountains piled high with logs, and so did not enter. They did not ask who the trees had belonged to and why the mountains were being logged. They did not look around the forest on the valley side of the mountains and ask to whom the trees belonged and what may be their fate. On the valley and ocean sides of the mountains, 60 years after the last logging of the old growth forests, the new forests were beginning to take form. Within the forests, trails and parks grew. People came from near and far to be in the forests and saw that it was good. Then one day, on a peninsula in an area sacred to locals, kept secret, marked on no maps, suddenly, as if by way of visitation in the night, there appeared flags, fluorescent, orange, inscribing in letters of black the imminent fate of the forest. When the few locals who knew about the legacy of the forest saw the logging tapes, the alarm was sounded. So we gathered, so we asked, and learned that logging was about to begin not just through this one ascent to the cliffs, but on all the mountains, and no longer out of sight. Those who had seen the backside of the one mountain stripped nearly bare, and those who had witnessed the clear-cut on Zuhalem shuddered. Then we, a growing community of people asking, were told that they, our municipal government, had a job to do and must continue to log as always, as was dictated. But we, the citizens coming together, realizing the greater value of the forest, understood that there is no they, no other corporation, logging our forests, but only we who are our own local self-governing body. If the world is changing and our understanding of the ecology, economy and human needs changing with it, and yet our rules and bylaws growing outdated, then we must come together to change what can and must be changed. The people of this valley have inherited a great and rare legacy. The time has come for us to remember what is our duty to protect, our right to understand, and our responsibility to decide over, not just for ourselves, but for our children and all who follow. Like a forest that requires all parts of the whole, not just the highest and strongest, but every aspect integrated in a continual exchange of give and take, so too with the community. In the face of what we value and where we are headed, connected with the fate of the six forests, there must be an intelligent open exchange of information, of consultation with all citizens and with faith in the wisdom of the majority from whom collective visions may be born. What is needed is trust that given time to pause, to reflect, to feel the way of the greatest possibilities, the people will ask the right questions and make the right decisions. With the gifts of this earth, we are not given rules and roadmaps to follow, but the heart that we may feel. When the heart is open, the way is clear. Above all, as below, we must become as the trees beneath the surface rooted within the silence joined. Nowhere is it written that we may not learn from our mistakes. To make a difference, even a small difference in this world, is not enough, it is everything.
So there we go. That's the movie um, made by the organization you put together called Where Do We Stand? You and Friends. So remind viewers again why you made this gorgeous movie. Well, we had just a few weeks, when we found out that the logging road was going to come in before Christmas yeah. in this area and in other areas, yeah. and that the public didn't know that the mountains were public owned, we were almost in a panic mm -hmm. um, because we had five weeks, I think, in order to, if that, it was a council meeting before Christmas we were allowed to present, mm. and realizing that, you know, how do you suddenly make an entire population aware of something like this? Yeah. So um, the film was the only way we could think of to, yeah. to make it public as soon as possible. Yeah. So what was the response to the movie? Well, 2,000 people saw it in a couple of days, Whoa. which was shocked us. <laughs> we just found out 12,500 people have seen That's it. That's impressive. So it's obviously touching a chord. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's, you know, the forests are in the news everywhere. Right. And, and so the number one message that you want to leave people with from the movie? In North Cowichan, the number one message is that we need to, first of all, inform everyone. We need to talk about this. This is an extraordinary, I don't, we haven't touched on this, but yeah. North Couch and these 5,000 hectares, public owned, it's the only forest like it in North America. Yeah. There are crown forests, there are um, yes. forest lands owned by industrial companies. Yes. There, a crown land does not have different specifications for a community forest on, on crown land. Yeah. Does not mean it's protected by the community. There, it's, there yeah. are no rules. We can make our own rules. With That's this, amazing. It's, we have yes. so much power. Yeah. So for North Couch and citizens to realize how important it is we inform ourselves, yes. we just got pause. We, in this movie, you see we asked for pause. Yes. And public consultation. Public consultation for us is everything. So pause means just hold off on future logging. Right. right. And there was a, the day after, the, at the council meeting, we asked for pause. The next day, there was that enormous storm throughout BC. We on the 20th. remember, we all remember, yes. So we got pause. <laughs> we literally got pause. There were trees everywhere. We had to yes. stop. And uh, in the end, what has happened, many people saw this as an opportunity yeah. to pause because there are yeah. thousands and thousands of dollars worth of... So you of did get ahead of the story then. Sorry. <laughs> the meeting that happened before Christmas, right. how did that go? So the meeting before Christmas was confusing to everyone, including council. We came suddenly out of no nowhere. The, the, there had never been anything like it at council. There were, the council room was full, people were wrapped around the walls, shoulder to shoulder, people were wow. sitting on the floor, the foyer was full, wow. the spillover room was filled, people had to leave and wow. watch at home. So <laughs> council was absolutely amazed. We were amazed. Yes. No one knew what would happen. So they didn't, the, that there was such a lot of public interest there was enormous, around their own forest. Right, yeah. but that was in uh, such a short time to inform yeah. the public. And even still, most people don't know. Yeah. So we're still feeling how to, you know. Yeah, and so that was a week before Christmas. Right. And then what happened? So after Christmas, it's hard to remember all the steps, well, but. Don't need, the, don't need the details, but, but come, come to the. So we had a, a couple of weeks ago, there was a meeting where the forests were put on the budget. Right. We're, we're being, it seemed like the future of the forests were going to be decided by the budget. So yes. we panicked yes. yeah. <laughs> again, yeah. many people and came together and yes. uh, approached council with council or the, um, I'm, the, I think it's the forestry department. Come, anyway, yeah. the staff came out with a report. Yes. It was back and forth, councillors yes. and the public, and eventually the, the council came out with this wonderful recommendation, pause, using the, the, uh, yeah. these trees that had fallen yeah. during that storm, yes. and public consultation. Yeah, and if I'm, rem they had, there, was a, there was a forest advisory committee before? A forest advisory committee. A very small, limited group. Right, four people from the yeah. three uh, professional foresters and one biologist. Yeah, and they've now blown that wide open? They've. They've brought in four people from First Nations, two yeah. other people, a mm -hmm. biologist and urbanet. Right. Yeah. The, so it's growing. So you've got the opportunity for public engagement through that committee, and it yes. the meetings are open, I believe. They are. And you've are. got the pause to stop and think where we're we going? Yeah. It, it, hopefully, we don't know how yes. public consultation is going to happen. This will be the biggest part of it, yeah. is 
gauging what the community actually, yes. informing the community that we own these mountains and we yes. have this responsibility. So do some people respond by saying, oh, you're, you're just, you tree huggers, you want to just stop all logging altogether with that kind of thinking? We don't find that there are that many. Okay. There, there are, right. There's definitely people from a more traditional status quo yes. perspective, yeah. but it's generally, um, who can tell at this point? Right. There, you know, there may be many more people than we're aware of. Yeah. So, but have you got a clear sense of what you want the future of the forest to be? Are you, are you just asking, let's stop and talk about it? I would say most people I've spoken with and, and who have written into where do we stand. Yes. There are so many, you know, there's eco-forestry, there's park, there's nature preserve, there's yeah. so many ways to look at how this forest. Right. So it's time to look at all the options yeah. is what we're hoping for. So you know about the way they're doing forestry at Wildwood up in Cedo in our area. Not as well as you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I, was, so the, they have, it's much smaller. They have yes. 55 hectares. Right. Or Mer Merv Wilkinson managed that land since 1938, had 55 right. hectares compared to 5,000. And he managed the whole forest on a basis of treating it how to, as close to nature as possible. Right. So never do a clear cut. Um, let the best seed, trees plant their seeds. Um, keep the, the multi-age, so the really old trees. I remember him telling me that, you know, in a human population, you've got really old people and you've got babies. They're all mixed. And you don't have all just 60-year-old trees. Mm -hmm. And what I, when I, 20 years ago, he gave me some numbers that basically said that he cuts the annual growth every five years, the, the cumulative growth. And after 60 years, when he did an inventory, the whole forest was still standing, and he'd pulled out 7,000 cubic meters of a, th of a forest that's 3,000, 4,000 cubic meters in total. So he was getting, seemingly getting a lot more timber by logging and managing his forest mm. in a way that's close to nature with much older trees, which was like, wow. Which is similar to, well, you know Lubeck, you've written a great article on it, and yes. Herat Proctor, there's a few situations like that? Well, the Herat Proctor, um, is on Kootenay Lake. They, right. They've got 11,000 hectares, but most of it's steep mountainside. And so they are managing it in all sorts of ways, but the fundamental principle is mimic nature. Mm -hmm. don't, do, don't go in and do big clear cuts, mimic nature. So they're community-owned cooperative, right? And I brought some slides about Lubeck, if we want to cover, cover Lubeck. So let's just go to the, the slides on Lubeck for a minute. Lubeck is a community-owned municipal forest in Germany. Um, isn't it the it's same size? 5,000 hectares. Okay. It's a beech forest. So it's really hard to compare. So in, in fall, it looks like this. And um, there they are, you know, logging the trees. So it's a very different kind of forest. And they individually select the trees, never try to mimic nature. They pull them out by horse because they, they really don't like heavy machinery on the soil because it crushes the soil organisms and all the air pockets and the root, roots and stuff like I'm just that. I was going to say, just because I've heard people yes. um, questioning the Lubeck model in the yes. fir forest, there are, they also use small machines, And small I guess. gauge machinery, right. it's very right. narrow, yes. So and these are the two, Kurt Sturm and Lutz Faeser, who sort of helped me write that piece about Lubeck. Mm -hmm. And then what's astonishing is they have very good numbers, which are very comparative to the numbers from North Couchen. So this, for viewers, this might seem overwhelming, but just take the top column. So the size of the harvestable forests are both 5, 000, around 5,000 hectares. Um, Lubeck has a fourth 470 reference forest, hectare reference forest, they never log to see how nature's behaving. They both got similar volume per hectare of 486 and 429 cubic meters. They both have a similar annual allowable cut of around 14,500. In North Couchen, they plant 49,000 seedlings a year. In Lubeck, they plant none because they let the nature do it. In North Couchen, the average cut block, which is clear cutting with about 10 trees left per hectare standing, is seven hectares, and in Lubeck, it's zero hectares. In North Couchen, they have eight or nine jobs a year. In Lubeck, they have 30. In North Couchen, they got 1,100,000 1, 1, income. In Lubeck, they got 1,900,000 income. So Can we go back to that? No, the, yes. Tell me if you've heard the same. I've heard Herat Proctor. Yes. The average, uh, I think it's an average, one person is employed by 1,000 cubic hectares in the forestry industry. Cubic meters. Sorry, cubic meters. Yes. What did I say? Cubic, cubic hectares. hectares. Like, <laughs> cubic cubic hectares would be like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so cubic meters. Um, whereas Herr Proctor yes. is now up to eight um, people per. Really? So Couchen is implying two people per 1,000 cubic meters. Okay. And 
Herat Proctor is eight. Lubeck is giving, have we got the numbers right? No, the, no, no sorry. North County is getting half a job. They're getting eight, eight jobs. We're going to lose our viewers if we go into this too carefully. Right, right, right. Sorry. F for a similar cut of around 14,500, they're getting eight jobs in North Couch and 30 in Lubeck. Not, Harrop Proctor has their own mill as well. Right. So maybe they count those jobs. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But what this is showing is that you can log in a different way. Mm -hmm. You get just as much timber out, mm -hmm. just as many jobs, just as much income without having to do any damaging clear cuts. And I assume you're also talking about um, value-added wood. In, certainly in Harrop Proctor on Kootenay Lake, they have their own mill, they do a lot of value-added stuff. Merv Wilkinson did a lot of value-added. He found that um, he could get 80% of the value of a log could be used, whereas typically in the mills it's like 55%, so he's getting more value out of it. And he was also getting a 10% premium price because of the quality of the timber. The same in Lubeck, it, it's and Harrop Proctor, it's for certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, yeah. so they're getting a premium price for that. Which is a hard, isn't it hard to oh, get that? They, they'll give you a, put you through the rigmarole to get that. Right. So all this is indicating some really good options for North Couch. Mm -hmm. well, you know, they may be looking at 15 different ways of doing mm -hmm. stuff, but these are just bits of evidence to put on the table. Well, uh, two, one of, two of the new members of the Forestry Advisory Committee are quite knowledgeable about this. Okay. Um, one of them is a bio coming from a biologist's yes. point of view, but the other um, um, is an ur urban landscape yeah. expert and is very involved with UBC. Right. And he, he teaches at UBC yeah. and so is very much in touch with their forestry yeah. department. Right. That this is what everyone's talking about is sustainable ecosystem based yeah. Yeah. forestry. So, so clearly, Lubeck is a beach forest in Germany, but yeah. Wildwood is yeah. a coastal Douglas fir forest right exactly. here on the island. Exactly. Very, very similar. Exactly. And I know Melv Wilkinson was pretty controversial at the time, you know, but there's a, I th don't know if you pick this up, there's a feeling in the air among people. Absolutely. Of some sort of Including growing council. planetary emergency yeah. around climate and ecology. No question. It's, and it's, even the last six months, what, six months ago I knew nothing of any of this, yes. but every time I open a newspaper there's something about this. Yeah. And actually, this, when uh, we have a big meeting on Tuesday, we planned this meeting before yes. we were given pause. This was going to be to ask for pause, like, yeah. you know, continuing to try and get public support and interest. But now that we have pause, it's, uh, it's become something else. We have experts from all over the province yes. coming to this meeting yeah. on Tuesday. To help. We all have to learn. It's, it has to be put out to the public in every yes. possible way. That, yeah. um, but anyway, when, when to several of the speakers who've been involved in advocating for forests for decades, yes. um, including Ray Travers, who's a registered forester. Yeah, professional, yes. He said he's been waiting all his career for something like this, what's wow. happening in North Couchin, where the public actually takes ownership mm. um, of the forests around them, which, so Annie McKinnon, Ronnie yes. Penn, yeah. all these familiar names. Because normally the barrier is, well, it's privately owned. Right. North Couchens Forest is That's it. owned by the municipality, well, which is by the voters. Yeah, and this is where I don't want to, I'm not saying I'm advocating yes. sustainable forestry yes. or park, or I'm yes. not advocating anything yeah. other than that all points of view, including, yes. you know, traditional seven hectare clear cuts. Maybe yeah. that's the way, I don't know. Yeah. I want to hear everything. Yes. But what was amazing to me is these meeting all these people who've been involved in advocating for forests for decades. Yes saying this is the chance where different methods of forestry yes. could be practiced, tried. This is, it's wow. almost like a, they're thinking this could be, you know, where so experts from all over come together. So North Couch and the municipal forest could become a showcase. That's what people are saying. For managing a forest in right. a way that's appropriate. With all, all values, ecological, yes. economic, yes. social. And frankly, the, the natural forest wants to have trees that are up to 400 years old. Exactly. So yeah. do we need a 400-year development plan? That's exactly how people are talking. <laughs> Seriously, they are. And, and, that, and that is because of the complexity. We yeah. don't even begin to understand yeah. of the, you know, the underworld, right. the, 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 the canopy, yes. and also the um, fungal network underneath. The right. And it's so complex, you don't want me to get into yeah. it. But so, so we're going to have to wind up in a couple of minutes, but right. I know speaking not as a forester, but as a human living in the forest, right. what's it really mean to you? Well, for me, like most people, it's, it's where I, I'm grounded. It's the, the most real experience I ever have is in a forest and on the ocean, but yes. in nature. And yes. that's, that's just human. Yeah. And 
you know, it's why 80,000 people, well, actually 120,000 between our two parks or more yes. came to the forest last year. They, it's, it's, it's where we connect. Do you see the trees as a thing or as a being? Oh, it's a being. A being. <laughs> is so anybody, does anybody see the forest as a thing? Lots of people do. Do you think? Oh, yeah. What's um, it mean that you think of the trees as beings? That's like asking me what my, my dogs, my children, the, I live with, where I live on an ex, a point where yes. I'm surrounded by everything. Eagles, yes. whales come by. It's, it's all connected. It's... Uh, because a lot of us have grown up with good scientific education. Right. We're taught to be objective. We're taught right. to be distance. We're taught to not get ourselves involved. Right. And effectively, that's saying that nature's a, a thing. I am considered to be on the spectrum. So <laughs> I didn't fit well into the real world when I was young. I spent all my time in the forest. Right. So I had mystical experiences from a little kid. Well, wow. Not spiritual experiences, yes. but, you know, shaman-like, but innocent as a child. Can so you recall one? I have experienced, as a young person, I had no experience of this, but I've yeah. experienced molecular reality break down on a quantum level where I've been the entire, everything has become a breath. And that's as a child. You come By breath, several, right? you know, every, I could feel the breath in every, wow. th there was yeah. no physical reality anymore. It was just everything yeah. was breathing. There's just infinite cells. And well, uh, there are no words to explain these things. How old would you have been then? Ah, oh. <laughs> that's another more like more like twenty. Okay. But yeah. But you do anybody First Nations? I share these stories. I've never said this in public. Yes. <laughs> but I, I certainly my friends who are First Nations have experienced this. They understand the same way. Yeah, it's it just happens when you grow up in the in nature. You it's it's not that unusual. Yeah. Well, that's pretty special. So what you're doing here in helping to mobilize your friends and other people in North Couchin to get involved, to realize that they can play a role in the future of the forest is really big. It's a really valuable What's thing. What's really big is realizing how many people, I assume North Couchin is like everywhere, people just, as soon as they know, they want to do something. Yes. Because after all, I mean, all of us living on Vancouver Island, we're in the forest, we love the forest, whether right. it's... And, but also, there are jobs coming from the forest. Absolutely. There's our economy based in the forest. We can't just cut that off. No, absolutely. Right. So we, we've got to marry the mystical and the material. Boom, right? I have to say, <laughs> if, if we have a second, yes. um, a lot of my friends are log. I, I actually build. I've been building with timber, with timber for years. There you go. I have to, you have with value added timber. That's actually how the film started. Yeah. I was working with my timber framer friend. Yeah. When you talk about it all coming together, all of my friends who are loggers and, yes. and foresters, I have lots of yes. friends who are... Yeah. They love, why do you think they live in the forest? There why do you think they go. work in the forest? They love the forest. There you go. Yeah. Right. Well, look, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much Thank for giving you. leadership on all this sort of stuff, yeah. right? So this has been the show, Change the World. Um, my name is Guy Dornsey. One of my little contributions is this novel I wrote called, Chain, called um, Journey to the Future, A Better World is Possible, set in Vancouver in the year 2032, when people are living visions of, of a better future in the streets, in their economy, in their buildings, in all sorts of ways. So if you like this kind of show and more guests, tune in next week for more, and thanks for watching.